My name is Karen McLean, and I'm a senior director um, here in Alumni Affairs. Um, my focus is on our partnership with athletics and our strategic initiatives. And again, I'd like to welcome you all here. I'd like for you to take a few minutes to tell us about yourself um, and currently what you're doing. So you want to start, Julia? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Julia Pitts, um, better known as Juju, during my time playing on the basketball team. I grew up in California, um, so I'm local and chose UCLA because it was close to home and it's a great school. Um, after playing basketball, actually I should say, during my time at UCLA, I sustained a pretty bad knee injury and I uh, was never able to fully play a, a full season. And it kind of, that altered what I'm doing now. I had to dress in street clothes often for games if I wasn't playing, and it really sparked my interest in fashion. Um, so after school, I actually moved to New York, and um, I pursued modeling for some years. I still do it a little part-time, but um, I guess blessing in disguise. Um, being injured, having to get cute on the bench, and <laughs> wanting to be cute on the runway, so um, that's what kind of led me into pursuing um, modeling and pursuing working in wardrobe styling. Um, like I said, I've been in New York for um, the last four years now. I moved to New York, hated it the first time, came back home. Um, it's a tough city. Anyone who's from there or has visited, you know that. But um, I decided to give it one more go. And I guess uh, playing sports most of my life is what also fired that interest to give it one more shot. Um, so yeah, this week, um, I'm just home for a few days visiting. Um, it's also my last week in New York City, and I'm going to be moving to Houston, Texas. Um, I have some family there, and I have to share it with you, my boyfriend was just hired by the Houston Police Department. So it'll be a new chapter in my life, something different, and not quite sure what I'm gonna do for work yet, because I'll be new to the city, but um, hopefully I can continue to work in fashion and modeling. It's my passion right now. Thank you. And we can hook you up with the uh, Houston alumni. Exactly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> exactly. All right. Great. Anna? So I'm Anna. I came to UCLA wanting to become a literature professor. So it's odd that I'm on a panel here. Um, I was really interested in English and medieval literature and all of a sudden, the 2007-2008 men's basketball team happened. Um, that was Russell Westbrook, Kevin Love, Derek Collison, all the great guys. And I never was into sports at all in high school, never played sports, um, but just signed up for the Den season package on a whim to be social. And loved every minute of it. Amazingly, my freshman year, we didn't lose any home games that I attended for basketball or football, which considering that was under Carl Durrell was a surprising year, but 13-9. <laughs> So I was really in love with sports. I had no idea what I was doing, so I spent a lot of time researching. I was reading Sports Illustrated. I was looking back at all the archives. Any and every sport article I was reading, it was golf, it was NASCAR, I didn't care. I wanted to know more about it, and I got to the point where I was doing that almost as much as I was reading an iambic contaminator. And after talking to a lot of my professors, I realized that I wanted to go into a career in sports. And this was about junior year here at UCLA, so I randomly applied to about every internship that was available. And I was hired for two internships at Fox Sports. And one of them happened, we, I, we clicked, and it turned into a job. And I've been there for five years. We do the television scheduling for our regional sports networks, like Fox Sports West and Prime Ticket, as well as Fox Broadcast Channel, Fox Sports One, which just launched in 2013, and the Fox College Sports. So I've got my hand in just about every sports pie that we've got cooking over there at Fox. Um, because I didn't think that my English degree as a bachelor was just enough, I really wanted to get my master's. I went to the University of San Francisco to get my master's in sport management. So that was a great two years. I had one month off after walking here, um, not at Poly, unfortunately, it was under construction, um, and to going to their satellite campus in Orange. So it's been a really amazing experience to see that, you know, five years after graduating, I'm in the field I want to be in and working with people I want to work with and doing what I love. <coughs> okay, <coughs> looking at the old game bills, 82, that's a long time ago. Some of you probably wouldn't have been born in 82. 
Not a lot of black here, just kids. Um, well, let me tell you a little bit about myself. Um, like Juju? Yes. Like Juju. I grew up in LA. Um, I grew up in South Central LA and uh, from a very humble background. Um, neither of my parents went to college. Um, my dad eventually got his GED uh, when he was much older and I think my mom got as far as the fourth grade. Um, so, you know, education wasn't necessarily a priority in, in my family. Uh, however, and I share this story, story and I've shared it many, many a times. Um, when I was in the sixth grade, I had a teacher uh, who attended UCLA, um, and she drove a, a Volkswagen, and um, on the back of this Volks Volkswagen were these gigantic letters, UCLA, and I had no idea what it meant, and I had the courage one day to approach her, hey, tell me what are those letters? And she told me, you know, that's a college, that's a university, and Anita, if you work hard, this is the sixth grade, uh, you too can go to UCLA. Uh, so from that moment on, I made a decision that I was going to work hard, I was going to be the best student that I could possibly be, and attend UCLA. And uh, I grew up in the USC, so I really didn't want to go there, um, <laughs> for a lot of reasons. But uh, I ended up uh, getting accepted to UCLA, and uh, one of my, my dreams became reality. Uh, I came to UCLA, uh, went to LA High School. This was a big university, uh, had no idea what to expect, again, knowing no one that had ever attended college. Uh, I did play high, uh, basketball, high school basketball, and that was fun, but honestly, I didn't know that even at the college level, there was a lot of basketball going on. So I'm like a pioneer, I guess you would say. Um, I came to UCLA as a walk-on. Uh, Ann Myers was here. She was a, a sophomore at the time. I, I came in as a freshman. Um, just wanted to have something else to do and try it out for the basketball team, and the rest is history. And we are that team that won the uh, 1978 championship. Uh, however, I'm, I'm very proud of our women's team this last season who, who won the WNIT uh, this year, and that's a, a fabulous, fabulous, fabulous accomplishment as well. Um, so UCLA and, and the college life was um, a life-changing experience for me. It really made a difference in my life. It made me uh, consider some of the things that I wanted to, to do in the future. I got a chance to coach a couple of years here as assistant. Uh, I wanted to play in what was a, um, long before the WNBA, it was called the Women's Professional Basketball League. And I played in that league for a couple of years. Uh, then I went on to what I wanted to do in high school. I, I became uh, a police officer. In law enforcement, I was very intrigued by that because I think in my heart, I'll, I've always been the kind of person that wanted to help and give back. And to me, that was one of the best ways to do it. I, did, I wanted to stay home, so I, I chose Los Angeles Police Department. I just completed my 31st year. It's been an incredible roller coaster ride. It has been just an incredible ride. Uh, very rewarding, but honestly, had it not been for sports, and the things that I obtained during sports, comp the, comp the competition, uh, the dedication, the uh, teamwork. Uh, I don't know if I could have been as successful as I've been in the Los Angeles Police Department. Um, there's something to be said about uh, female student athletes and, and their heart and desire to accomplish what they want to accomplish. And I think Juju is a, a great example. And she couldn't play, but look what she did. She branched out and then continued to do something that she felt would, would be rewarding and it resulted from athletics. So I'm here now and I'm glad to be a part of the panel and um, thank you. Oh, I forgot about my, other, my tenth job. No, I'm just kidding. We all got <laughs> from that. Um, so at some point during my law enforcement career, I. Uh, I got bored. Um, when I was a sergeant, I had this free time and I decided, you know, what can I do? I have this extra time. Do I want to go out and 
teach? Do I want to continue to play pickup ball? And um, I found out about officiating. So I started officiating um, while I was a supervisor, uh, sergeant in the LAPD, and had no idea that this officiating was going to take me to Division One, the Pac-12, the WAC, the WCC, because I thought, you know, I can do a couple of high school games and, you know, make a little extra money to pay for lunch. But this became like a second career. So I have been doing uh, Division One basketball for um, about 20 years. I've gone to the NCAA uh, every year uh, since I started. And so, you know, I'm, I'm really happy. And again, all of that was because of UCLA, all of this is because of basketball, all of this is because of all the things that uh, life has taught me during my experience here. Thank you. And I think I'm right when I say she is the highest ranking female in the LAPD. Uh, Afro Puerto Rican. Yes. Afro Puerto Rican, okay. That's quite an accomplishment. Um, I'm Katrina Long. I am a Cal grad, 77, Anita, so rest assured, you're not the oldest person here. Um, but I uh, took a very uh, unusual route to this career. I've been 37 years in intercollegiate athletics at five different universities. Um, I actually fell into it through tutoring. Uh, when I was a student at Cal, I was an anthro major. I went up there to be Jane Goodall. And um, I had great dreams of pursuing graduate education and going to study the great apes. But I needed a work-study job, and I ended up tutoring anthropology first. And then I kind of fell in love with the tutoring and teaching. Um, we worked with the EOP students. We worked with um, students that were uh, immigrants and uh, ESL students, English as a second language. I eventually worked with um, students who had disabilities, um, which at that time, if you could imagine 37 years ago, the, the way that technology has affected students with disabilities being able to come and study at a university um, has been remarkable. But the last special interest group they actually gave me was student athletes who were tutored through this um, program that ran through a general campus dean's program. And Having worked in the <coughs> other, with the other groups, I was sort of surprised that all of these great best practices we were doing with these other groups weren't being done with the student athletes. And so I was young and sort of asked the tutor supervisor, you know, why weren't you doing this or that? And he didn't really pay too much attention to me. <laughs> but when I graduated, right when I graduated, uh, the supervisor of the tutoring program for athletes quit the job. And so my boss was sort of stuck and he said, it was mid-year, I was a December graduate, they were on the quarter system then. And um, having been a little disillusioned also, by the way, if you, you none of you know this, but in 77, um, the Gombe Stream Reserve was actually taken over by African nationalists who were there to protesting at the same time um, there were protests in America. Um, they were protesting the fact that Europeans were coming over to take care of the animals while the people were starving. So I thought, this isn't you know, really the best time to pursue that. So I, I started thinking, well, maybe I'll, I'll take this opportunity. And I was very scared because I had never supervised anyone before. Uh, but my boss said, if it doesn't work out, don't worry. You know, you can come back to tutoring otherwise. Well, it became a passion, and it's obviously been a lifelong uh, career path for me. I was able to put some of those great new ideas in place, working with fantastic coaches at Cal at the time who were really willing to to let me be the expert in the academic area. Kids were incredibly receptive, and um, people are people, and if you put a high bar, especially to athletes, they're going to meet it. If you put a low bar, you know, they're probably gonna dip down to it. So we set a high bar academically, and um, it was just a very, very positive experience. After a couple of years, though, I was, um, felt like I was still at my same institution, and so I began my around-the-country uh, trek. And uh, I looked for a job, <coughs> I found an opportunity at Southern Methodist University. I didn't know much about these uh, Texas or the South. And uh, I was from Berkeley. I asked my faculty rep if that was a good place to go. He said, great. Well, I went down there for the time for which they got the um, NCA death penalty. I had no idea about that when I got there. I was the only female administrator in the, ba in the football stadium, which was completely separate from the rest of the athletic department. And I quickly got there, and they say six flags over 
Texas, they literally were flying different flags in different counties, and I was very confused about whether or not they knew we were actually in America at the time. <laughs> so that was a little frightening, but um, I had a great boss, and that's one thing that I can say for those of you that are out there looking for jobs. I have always worked for fabulous bosses, and they have been very generous to me, but they have also let me learn, they've let me fail, they've been uh, supportive, and they always let me tell the truth. And I don't think that happens on everyone's career path, but I feel very, very lucky that I was able to do that. One of my staff even came to me today, she's 42, and she's applying for another job, and I would hate to see her go, but of course I'm giving her my full support. It's a chance for a promotion. She literally, at 42 years old, started crying and saying I was the first boss she ever had that was supportive of her looking for something else. So if you're a boss, uh, that's something important for you too. In any event, um, things were very odd at SMU. We had no, I was in charge of academics, eligibility, um, admissions, all of those kinds of things. We had no problems in my area, but it became very clear that the boosters were just running amok and the kids had cars and there was just all kinds of money down there. And frankly, it was happening at a whole a conference level. So I was very unhappy. I asked my boss if I could leave about a month in, and he said, he threatened me with a contract. It's the first contract I'd ever signed. I really thought he could sue me. And he, he wasn't about to do that, but he was just trying to say, stay, and let's work through this. So I stayed for a year and a half, but it was a very difficult experience for me. And um, as I said, it was the time for which they ultimately got the death penalty, and they've never really recovered from that. Because of that, I went on to Columbia University, which is an Ivy League. I was thinking about getting out of athletics, but I really didn't want to go back to California at the time, and I saw a job in the Ivy League. It was a fabulous opportunity. Spent 10 years there, um, and got married and had my daughter there. It was a wonderful experience, but we did go 0-44 in football. So um, <laughs> that was had its own trauma. And in fact, if you know Jason Garrett, who's the head coach of the um, Cowboys. Now, his father was our coach, one of the four coaches in the four, he was one of the four head coaches that we fired in the first five years I was there. It's 44 coaches we fired in my first five wow. years there. So I went out of the front, the front and in the fire. Um, and that was a rough experience. Um, coach Garrett started out wearing a suit every day and a tie, which most coaches, most football coaches don't wear, so a few do on game day, but they don't usually wear it in the office. By the time he left, he was so emotionally traumatized. He had all his coaches wearing these overlong um, blue t-shirts. Their blue is a little bit like our blue. And it said, coach, from here to here. And I thought, oh my god, if you've ever seen a symbol of somebody dissembling, there they are. <laughs> but he put all three of his kids, he had five kids, and I had three of his kids on our football team, and they all got Ivy League education. So that was very important to Fabulous environment being at uh, Columbia. And I learned a lot about uh, selective admissions, a lot about um, just uh, social justice and athletics as well. It was a really, really wonderful time. But raising a family there, you talk about New York City, it was a great time. It was a safe place to be in within a university campus, but um, we had housing and all. But I came back to California to bring my, uh, my daughter back to my mom. It was her only granddaughter. Went to UC Irvine and started working for Dan Guerrero down there. Little did I know, 21 years later, I'm still working for Dan Guerrero. <laughs> so he was wonderful to work for. He had just come from Dominguez Hills. I came a month after he started at Irvine. And we were able to take a fairly young program that had been hit uh, by a few of the um, downturns in the economy in the state of California. And we were able to add programs. We added. Um, women's water polo, uh, golf, and rowing, and also baseball while we were there. And that was at a time when people were dropping sports. So he really grew the programs. We had a wonderful time. And then this job became open, and he looked at it. And to tell you the truth, one of the wonderful things about working for him is that until this job opened up, we didn't really know it was his dream job. We thought he was at his dream job because he was so passionate about growing the program down there. So he left, I was the interim director down there for a little while, and then uh, about a year later, I came up to be his one of his associate ADs. My current role is now I am, I have a big title, Executive Associate Director of Athletics. It's really Deputy Director. Um, he didn't like that term, I guess. But um, I moved into that this past summer, and all of 
those sports supervisors report to me. So football, men's basketball, and all the other um, 25 sports report up through me. I have three sports of my own, baseball, uh, gymnastics, and women's basketball. And um, so I manage the managers, basically, and I've moved a long way from those first years of tutoring individual students and student athletes to now kind of running the senior leadership of the program. Have a great opportunity to serve um, on many various boards and things on campus and to integrate within the larger campus in, in a variety of ways that I'll be happy to talk about later on. Thank you very much. Um, Julia. <laughs> um, being a student here and your experience, um, would you please speak up? Oh, sure. Is this better? Yeah. Okay. Being a student um, here at UCLA um, and your experiences, how has that helped you um, try to figure out what it is that you want to do going forward? As a student, um, it's honestly hard to think about my time at UCLA as just student. I was always student athlete, and um, though I sat through many lectures and <laughs> took lots of tests and wrote many papers, most of the experiences in my mind are from basketball, from sports, from my team and the time I spent with them. And it's my experiences. <clears throat> um, playing and being around the, the influence I had from my team, that is is what I would say usually drives whatever it is I'm doing. Um, like I said, it started with fashion. Um, I, I, I studied um, education. I minored in education while I was here. I was a social and education major. And um, I've always loved kids as well and sports. So although I was modeling, I also spent some time coaching kids with basketball. Um, I spent some time working as a tutor and at an elementary school, um, like an after school tutor. So I think it's just um, multitasking, I guess. Being a student athlete and multitasking has helped me to be able to multitask in life afterwards, after, um, after being here, figuring out exactly what I want to do. Like I said, I'm going to be moving soon. And I don't have work lined up at the moment, but I'm not concerned either because I've done so much from being a student athlete that I know once I get to Houston, something's going to call my name and I'm going to figure it out, whatever it may be. Um, so yeah, just the multitasking, I guess, uh, being a student athlete will help to figure out whatever it is that I'm going to do next. Hannah? research um, for the sports industry, but um, what impact has being a, a Bruin um, had on your, your career and kind of where you, you want to go? So I think we can all agree that UCLA is a pretty top-notch university. And I was taking a lot of serious classes here, just loving every minute of it. I, we had to take one senior seminar for the English major and I took six. I took three and one quarter just because I liked it so much. <laughs> um, and that really taught me how to prioritize. So I think part of the problem working in sports is that everything is coming in left and right. I get emails, I walk, go to the restroom, I come back, and I've got 20 new emails and I have to decide who gets answered first and who, you know, who really needs my attention and who can I pass off to someone else. So that was one of the things that I thought um, UCLA has really done for me is just learning how to manage my time. Grad school was not nearly as difficult. I knew a lot of my friends that were having a lot of problems with it, partly because they'd been out of the system for not you know a year. They took a year off, um, and I was just ready to go. And I had my eye on the prize the whole time. I wasn't. I had a lot of friends that were really concerned with their quiz scores and how they were graded on their essays, and. I was like that in high school, and I learned my freshman year at UCLA that no one cares what, <laughs> what grade you got on your test. They want to know if you, you know, how well do you know the material, and can you bring that back? Can you contribute? So once I was able to let that go, that really opened me up as a student, and I think that's helped a lot in my career because I'm not sitting there saying, well, what is this going to do for me? 
It's, some days are very frustrating. I deal with a lot of, you know, media people are, you know, have their own personalities. So it's nice to see the big picture from time to time and remember why I'm here and why to not give up. Um, Anita, you kind of alluded to this when you were speaking about um, being here at UCLA and having that as uh, a goal in sixth grade. Um, in terms of other uh, young people that are coming along, what type of advice would you give to them um, as far as being successful? Well, you know, if, if you're a student athlete, I think it's a part of your nature. You know, and you're driven and you, you want to accomplish goals. Uh, my experience here really helped me make a lot of uh, good decisions because being involved in sports, playing with other uh, teammates, you, you, you encounter decision making, you have to do a decision making process, uh, you have to be, uh, deal with challenges, you have to be decisive, you have so many things that, that can impact you. So uh, what I would suggest is that you, know, you really focus and, and keep on the prize and, and you can reach that goal. And, and through sports, you know, I, I've been able to do it. Um, I'm going to borrow from the March Madness uh, and the one shining moment. Um, having had a lengthy career, um, are there any shining moments that you have encountered that you'd like to share? Yes. The shining moments are always kind of generically the same. It's when um, a student athlete that I've worked with somewhere along the line um, says thank you at some point. Just comes back and says, you, you helped me. You've changed my life. And it comes in odd moments. I mean, sometimes it's at a banquet, but it's the, the person you least expected. Um, I still, I use my name, maiden name, and I still get calls. Um, my first students are now 55 years old because I was a student tutor and then I tutored other students. Um, and so they'll, they'll, every once in a while I'll get a call and I remember them, but I remember my students like, did you? I remember them where I saw them, 18 to 23. So in my heart, they're always little so-so, you know, they're just, kids and they'll always be kids that I love in my heart. So I think those are my shining moments because you realize that um, what we do here, having access to these great universities for many athletes is the only way they could possibly come to college. It's the only way they could afford to come. It's sometimes the only way they might have gotten noticed and gotten recognized and admitted. Certainly you look at how competitive this school is. And, and yet, because of the determination and the things they learn in athletics, they succeed. Um, and they succeed at, at all schools, you know, where the people are treating them properly. So it's really been a pleasure. So my shining moments are always my students. Anita, do you have any shining moments? Maybe. I'm sure you've had them. But. <laughs> <laughs> they, 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 <laughs> Just within your your career, um, you know the kind of those highlights. Sure, sure. Um, if I think about my career, my uh, profession now, I mean, just being a woman in law enforcement, uh, when I went on the department in 1984, uh, was wasn't a very popular career for women. But I've always been the kind of person, again, I attribute to athletics, I, I wanted to be different. You know, I, I wanted to do something that was not considered your typical female career, I guess. Uh, so that was uh, uh, to, to get through the academy and to, to reach uh, the rank of captain has been extremely rewarding. Uh, and I think about the assignment that I felt it's been most rewarding was uh, when I was the commanding officer uh, over a specific division, uh, Hollenbeck Division, which is near East LA. And um, I was the first uh, female to run a command. Typically in LAPD and part of other agencies, you don't find women that are in charge of 300 people. 
And so I was put over this division. Um, I had a, another captain that worked for me, lieutenant, sergeant, police officer, civilians. But it was over 300 people. And I kind of believe uh, the same way Katrina does, is that you know it's really nice when people come back to you and they thank you. You know, and I'm constantly getting emails and texts, texts from from those officers that work for me. And it's just rewarding. It's really good. But I think it, it goes back to you know what kind of person you are and, and how you treat people. And uh, obviously, Katrina's done an incredible job with people and they really appreciate her and I think that's important. And it's so rewarding to know that people that have worked for you appreciate you and sometimes you have to make tough decisions. You know? And it's not it's not personal. You know, it's always for the betterment of um, whatever your employment is and the betterment for the city in my, in my, in my situation. But it is rewarding to know that um, you can help people and, and influence people and, and be a factor in their life and, and be available to them Anytime. Anna, um, in terms of being involved in sports and doing your research for sports to um, figure out what it is that you wanted to do, did you have any mentors along the way? Coach here, uh, Kathy Olivier, 
because I always felt that uh, K.O. treated us um, like young adults and she wanted to prepare us for the real world life after basketball um, because, I mean, we all know for most student athletes, once you graduate, you most of the time that is the end of um, your playing. And I've always appreciated that about her. So, um, yeah, just playing sports, there are so many people who have influenced my life and who have made very strong impacts on them. And I mean, even um, teammates included. I still have great relationships with a lot of my teammates. And um, we still talk to each other. We still give advice when we need to. It really is um, just like coming to a second family once I came to UCLA and having even more people that I could call if ever I needed to. So yeah, I've definitely had a lot of people influence me, a lot of people who have been mentors, um, just a lot of people who have shown me the way. I've been very, very uh, lucky in that department. So the a good majority of the people here, we are Bruins, um, and this is to uh, the entire panel, um, if you can chime in as to what do you think we, as part of the Bruin family, can do to encourage young people to um, get involved in sports? Well, I'll take a shot at that one. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but first of all, in my career, there aren't very many UCLA Bruins, so I'm constantly defending my university. <laughs> <laughs> the majority of people that are law enforcement LA people are USC people. And this is this is hurts me, but that's okay. That's okay. Um, you know, I what I try to do is encourage um, some of my employees now. They have kids that are college age uh, to go to UCLA. In fact, uh, one of my employees, her son, um, will be coming here. In so I, I, I push UCLA on my Facebook. Uh, you know, I, I'm always talking about UCLA. Uh, when it comes to athletics, you know, I encourage all girls to participate in athletics. And of course, not everyone can go to UCLA, but if a young child uh, can get involved in athletics, I think that's, and I know, it's gonna make them a better person in the long run uh, to get that exposure and understand what competition is all about. Um, so those are ways that I, I try to encourage you know, young adults, you know, just by being a spokesperson myself, you know, and, and telling people that you know, this is where I went to school, you know, the type of university it is, and the experience that I had. And hopefully that would rub off um, onto them, and they could, would encourage their, their young children to you know, high school kids to, to come to this university. children, um, when I was playing, I have nieces and nephews that used to come see me play, and they just love being in the environment, being at a basketball game, just hearing uh, the fans cheering at most games. Um, sometimes we would stay in autograph um, posters for everyone in attendance, and I would see my little niece walk through, really excited that, you know, her auntie's here signing an autograph. Um, and I think just with, with most young children, they, they need like visualization. So even if you just bring a child up to the school, let them walk through Ackerman, let them see Joe, <clears throat> Joe Bruin, it's having the idea and just having something, actually having the idea when you say the school's name, you still like, it comes to them. Um, also, teaching them that eight clap. <laughs> My nieces and nephews love the eight clap, and still to this day, they love doing the eight clap. So I, I think, um, just finding something to spark that interest. And even, like Anita said, you were in the sixth grade and you saw UCLA, you were curious, you wanted to know about it. And the teacher said, it's a great school, it's somewhere you wanna be. So just instilling that in a child's mind, or I mean, even a young adult, um, that it is a great, it's a great environment. The campus is beautiful, letting them see this. Even driving up here, it's been a while since I've been on the campus, so I'm just looking at all the new sites, really excited about it. Just the school itself, it's, it's a sight on itself. It's really beautiful, so bringing children to the school, bringing young adults to the school, letting them see 
what they could see every day, I think that will play a huge role itself in it. I really am a big fan of the UCLA's I'm Going to College program, because some of my best moments where I felt most connected to the rest of my group family was at a sporting event. And to see, for me, I mean, I was incredibly lucky where education was just a given in my household, and the fact that I was not only going to get a bachelor's, but you know, even grad school was just something I was going to do. And to see kids that, for them, I mean, this is their first time seeing college and realizing that there is something that they can aspire to. I, I love volunteering for those. I think it's great to see them at the Rose Bowl. I'd like to see them walking around campus. Um, when I was looking to apply to college, I went to Cal, and they loved to show me all the things that their alumni had done. And when I came to UCLA, they showed me all the great things that I could do here. And I think stressing that you can make whatever you want of yourself here is really important. I just think that athletics is really a doorway to the community and to the larger um, larger society. And so we take that uh, responsibility really seriously. Um, over in the athletic department, we have all these fabulous people that have been through the program. And um, having been at five schools and not being an alum, I can tell you what a remarkable athletic program you have and what a remarkable university it is. It's very cohesive, even though there are islands of excellence across the entire thing. There's a cohesive sense about being Bruins, and I think athletics has contributed to that, and certainly Coach Woody did in large part, and that legacy continues on, um, where the incoming students are brought with a value system that's very understandable, and it permeates the entire culture. So, it's been remarkable, and it was remarkable for me to come as an outsider. One of the first panels I was on here was of four of our head coaches, and I'd been at, uh, I had been a part of two national championships in my 20 years before I got here, uh, in a 20-year career. And I realized sitting there that I had four Bruins. They had, three of the four had been student athletes. These were all women, and uh, Valerie Condos was not an athlete, she was a dancer here. She's our gymnastics coach. But they had won medals, uh, won national championships as students, and then again as coaches at their alma mater. And I thought, they don't even know this is unusual. <laughs> that, that's just the way they roll here. And so I knew it was a very special place, and you should be very, very proud of it. Are there any questions from the audience? Guys, that's some burning. So I worked uh, with the NBA for a long time and I started 
WNBA plays Mercury. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm curious to know about the different perspectives. You played after WNBA. You started, right? Yeah. Then started in 1997. Oh, yeah. So were you interested in playing for the WNBA, and how do you feel about the WNBA and the fact that it wasn't around when you were playing? And would you have been interested in it? Well, um, I came to UCLA. Um, I was a three, three-sport athlete in high school. I played volleyball and also ran track. I came to UCLA for basketball and track. And I always thought my future uh, was going to be more so in track. And I would be training for the Olympics. Um, when I injured myself, it was very early in my career, very early, preseason, freshman year, early. Um, so I had to, it's still probably a little bit interesting. Um, I knew that. You didn't get injured? Is that something that you would have liked to? I would have, again, I think I, if I had the opportunity, definitely. But I did always see myself more so pursuing track after college. But I mean, I just love being an athlete. So had I had the opportunity, most definitely. Yeah. And for me, um, you know, I played in the Pan American Games. I represented Puerto Rico uh, in 1979. That's when my dad was born. And I've always loved sports. And following um, um, the Pan American Games, I was drafted by what was then, I think I mentioned this earlier, uh, the Women's Professional Basketball League. Uh, there was a team in San Francisco, Dallas, New York, Iowa. Um, I think there was even one in like Long Beach. And I played in that league for two years. Uh, and had the WNBA been around, I would have absolutely because basketball was just a passion and I enjoyed it. I just couldn't understand how, why anyone would pay someone <laughs> to play a sport that you love. <laughs> well, I have to say, and to share with you guys, because I think you'll appreciate it, but I, I was not an athlete. I grew up playing tennis, but not um, But working, first of all, as a female and being part of such a historical, magical time, that we'll never see again. I mean, Cheryl Miller was the coach, you know. But, um, Thank you. Yeah. But um, Lisa Leslie, like all these women who were ambassadors and started something that was so powerful and so non-egotistical and the money wasn't even a thought really at that time because they were just so thrilled to be part of something that were, these were their dreams as little girls. And they were part of something that they really thought was going to come to play, you know. So, um, but you guys helped to pay for that. Thing, you know? So, yeah, I think you're right. I think that those leagues, there was an APL, a number of pro leagues that helped pay the way to the NBA. Ann yeah, Myers. Yeah, of course. With Ann, uh, you know, it's just, I hope it never goes away. I think when they need to have a place to, to express themselves in basketball for them. You should take your the people that you work with to the sports. Yeah. You <laughs> won't be the youngest. I'm sure they'll walk in. Actually, have OCR folks on 
campus right now um, that are here interviewing students over the next three days, and they're interviewing absolutely every student group possible, um, student athletes included. So um, I also oversee all the governmental relations, uh, academics, student services, compliance, um, the drug testing program, all discipline for all sports, um, admissions, uh, and all the policies. <laughs> so, uh, for the department. So, it is a big job. That's why I only have three sports, and it's um, it's we have a large department with a number of fabulous associate senior associates and associate directors, directors of different units, and so it's a big collaboration, and also in. Um, in collaboration with the campus. It's very important that we stay in sync with all of our campus colleagues. Um, second question. Um, you're just asking if being how, how useful being a college athlete, those skills are. It's so useful. It really is. Um, like I said, yeah, my, my field of work um, doesn't really tie in with playing basketball anymore, but it has helped with so much. Uh, I mean, I, I worked in retail for a bit, a bit bartending, and when you're used to being around people, um, I think it takes away from your selfishness. So you come into work, any field, with a mindset that we are a team. We are all here together, um, and we all have the same goal. Um, I, obviously, with basketball, it was two win games. When I'm behind the bar, it's to make money. And you know, you there's fellow bartenders behind the bar too, and maybe they don't see a customer, but you see that customer. So you go help that customer because they miss it. And at the end of the day, that's a joint tip. So it's just little things like that. Um, working in retail, the same thing. The object is, you know, to sell clothing. So you are working with your team and communicating. That's a huge one, communication. Um, that's something that was just like drilled in us playing the game. You have to communicate. So with every form of life, even if it's, uh, again, whatever I'm pursuing, communication has always been key and that is definitely something that I've, I've learned playing sports. So yeah, being a student athlete has definitely helped um, with pretty much everything I've done with life after college. Yeah. I can't disagree with her. Being a student athlete just plays a big role. Um, when I started playing basketball, I started playing with um, guys. I think, I don't know, I must have been the only strange female that wanted to play basketball. There were no other females playing at Tobin Park. Um, and, you know, I, I think ordinarily we, as women, young girls, we, we lack the confidence and self esteem. And through sports, you build the self-confidence, you build the self-esteem, you learn about leadership, uh, you confront issues, you have no fear, and that's what sports has done for me. It's allowed me to go into a profession that's male-dominated, but yet, frankly, I, I'm gonna do what I wanna do anyway, <laughs> let them know how I feel and whatever, you know. I'm sorry, I lost my professionalism for a minute. <laughs> I think that's only because of sports. You know, I, I have I have no issues with people and, and I'm not afraid to confront problems, I'm not afraid to take action and, and had it not been for sports and, and some of the things I experienced, I don't think I would have been able to do the things that I'm doing now. I think sports is even more important now with the new generation who do not know how to communicate verbally. <laughs> and I'm not kidding you, it's a problem. And in sports, you are forced to talk. You put those things away. Our coaches confiscate them at the beginning of a road trip, and they don't get them back to the end of a road trip. And they have to talk. They listen to adults. They follow instructions. They're disciplined. And they learn self-discipline, and they make choices. And it's really, really remarkable training for all kinds of goal setting. And you learn not to fear failure. You know, you're going to lose. Life is about, you know, a lot of wins and losses along the way. You don't have to let that devastate you. And so I think you see the success of people um, that have come through 
uh, athletics has been tremendous. So I think it's even more important nowadays. Katrina, I think this perhaps directly to you. Uh, have you ever taken this type of panel into the schools? And perhaps it might be a suggestion. Uh, my, our daughter was a, uh, an athlete, a college athlete. We now have granddaughters that are getting close to that, that situation. And many of the, the girls start dropping off. They start quitting. Some are really good. We see, we see them play uh, regularly in various sports. And they start saying, man, they don't want to do that anymore. And I think something like this, expanded perhaps into the schools, might uh, do just as much or more than bring him to uh, the football game. Yeah. You know, that, that type of thing. No, that's a great point. And I think a lot of us are taking people out into schools. We have um, big partnership programs with local area schools. The different teams do it a little differently. Um, some of the teams adopt a school and take um, take the student athletes out there once a month. They go out there. We have pen pal programs and other things. And then we have the I'm going to college program where we do bring them to large um, events that are on campus in sports other than football as well. We do it in a lot of our Olympic sports. So it is a powerful tool. And the way that um, the lines for kids in any sport, um, the lines that people will stand in to get the autograph of the student athlete they just saw are unbelievable. I'm thinking, oh my goodness, this is amazing. They wrap around Quali Pavilion, but those parents and those kids are so excited about these role models that it's really powerful. Hello, can you hear me? So this is a question for Petrina about the student athletes could weigh in as well. So I appreciate what was said about um, sports being a vehicle for getting uh, potential students at UCLA noticed so that they can be recruited to come to UCLA. Uh, but they come from uh, diverse backgrounds with varying levels of preparation. Uh, and so what I'd like to know is uh, what do you do on the recruiting end to deal with that? And then once they come here, especially because most of them are not going to go on and have professional careers, making sure that they finish. Thank you for asking that. We just uh, met with the lieutenant governor uh, on Tuesday and gave him a little tutorial because he didn't really know the kind of program that we have. We actually have a very comprehensive program that begins in the recruitment process. Our coaches are all trained on admission standards at, at standards at UCLA, and then they're trained additionally internally by us about what are the characteristics that we're looking for that make a, a special admit at UCLA successful, a special admit athlete successful here. Again, we use, we tap into that character building that they've already had and that uh, goal setting and the kind of determination that they have. And determination is not to be underestimated either. Um, UCLA is negatively recruited against because of our great academics in the athletic world. Isn't that sad? Um, but people try and scare off many of our revenue sports athletes by saying it's a great, you know, it's going to be too hard for you. So those kids are already sort of vetted, and our coaches press that. They meet with non-coaches when they come on their visits. They meet for a whole day with a variety of people on campus. They go to class, but they meet with people without the coaches in the room with them so that we can really vet them and ask them why are they here. <coughs> you know, they want to be a broadcasting major and think that's the major that we have here. They're at the wrong place, and we tell them we don't have that major. It doesn't mean you can't be a broadcaster coming out of here. So we'll talk about those kinds of things and make sure that the kids, um, they have personal interviews here. Sometimes they have admissions interviews separately. Um, we track all their classes. The earlier we get hold of them, the more we can tell them what classes to take. They're not all well advised where they're coming from. Um, once they get here, we pay for our student athletes on scholarship to come in pre-freshman summer and they go through a bridge program. The first thing they do is get their testing. So we do a battery of tests with them including a wellness assessment, and sadly I'm going to tell you that students today are having difficulty with anxiety and a variety of other kinds of things we just did not see six years ago in the student-athlete population. 
it was coming along in the campus population. We never saw it spill over to us, and now we've got it in a very high proportion. So um, we do all those tests. We get them in two classes for one or two summer sessions. They're, they've got mentors, they've got tutors, they've got counselors. Um, our counselors actually work for the dean of the college, so um, we've got some checks and balances there. So, and we use an individualized instructional program. There's no study hall for UCLA athletes. Each person now gets an individual study plan for that person. We have 700 kids. So, we're, our, our goal is to make them independent learners, so we really focus on the first year and over half of them kind of roll out of that program and they can just pick or choose what they want. And then as we move along, more and more of them kind of become self-sufficient. But there are some kids that actually have assistance all the way through. We track their grades, we work with our professors, we have good relationships and partnerships on campus, and we have very good graduation rates. We're very proud of it. Our football graduation rate is the second highest in the Pac-12, only beaten by Stanford, which is a private school and has, um, you know, to be a public institution, <coughs> we're competing with 20,000 undergraduates, not three, um, is really, really pretty phenomenal. So we're very, very proud of it. It's very expensive. It um, takes dedicated, committed people, and it takes broad campus partnerships. And it takes the will of the students to want to be here. And I do think that athletes have a little bit of an advantage nowadays because they actually get to get away from the academic pressure <coughs> and go out onto the field or something, they've got another set of pressure over there. But they can get away from the academics, which I think is what is um, some of the problem that's happening at the, at the highly selective schools now. I have a question for Anita about uh, officiating. Uh, yes. I used to officiate ice hockey and supervise officials, and when women's hockey kind of emerged in the, in the 90s, there was a big effort made to recruit and to develop and train female officials. To the point where the last Olympics, the women's hockey was officiated by all female officials. I was wondering, it's the same way in basketball, has there been a big effort to recruit and train female officials? Absolutely, absolutely. When I started officiating over 20 years ago, um, those that officiated women's basketball were men, and I'm not you know, a sexist or anything, but I, I think that you know, we have enough women now that can do that, but at the time we didn't have the women and they were recruiting more women to officiate uh, college athletics. <coughs> You're absolutely correct. And we're still doing that. So similar to what's going on here as far as the mentoring and counseling and supporting, I myself like to help younger officials so they can continue in this profession, because that's what it is. Yeah, it's good to see you by watching the women's dance, still see more male officials and female officials doing like, the women's college basketball games. Where is that? I'm sorry. This is the UCLA basketball game. It seems there are really? at least as many or maybe more men's officials than women. Oh, well, you know, I'll talk to Molly Palmer about that. <laughs> <laughs> I think what she can do. But, you know, I've, when I first started, it was very rare that you would have an entire female crew. Uh, now you see that more and more often. You really, really do. So, but I'll, I'll, let you, I'll make sure she knows about that. Showing my age a little bit here, but when I arrived in 1962, the only women's sports we had were kind of uh, football. <laughs> um, and, and a compliment to all of you. Uh, you are role models, every one of you. Uh, and we have a huge And having had the opportunities to meet Anita way back in the late 70s, right? And to see Julia. Uh, through the past 10 years, it's been just a remarkable experience. But let me ask you a question to give us information. As alums, as supporters of women's sports, and not to put down the men, okay, but women, really, really focusing on women's sports, what can we do as alum, as supporters to reach some of the goals that all of you have been talking about in terms of our student athletes and reaching out to the young women who are, are up and coming. What suggestions would you have? Well, I think this panel is a, a great idea you know, to have uh, student athletes and, and young people see what sports is all about and have them ask various questions uh, 
they talking about the school, constantly being supportive of the program that are the sports events that you like uh, is very beneficial. And uh, you know, just wear that blue and gold wherever you go. I think um, just dedicating time whenever you can. Um, uh, being out of the state, it's a little more difficult for me to come to games and uh, be around as often as I'd like to be. But at the start of every year, um, Pam will send an email to alumni and she asks us, what does it mean to be a Bruin? And we respond and she shares this with the team, the upcoming team or the girls who are still playing. Um, and there are a lot of things I think, yeah, the coaching staff helps to do that. There has to be that communication between the alumni and the coaching staff to keep us involved as alumni and to also let the current players know that there are alumni who are out there who are still supporting so that they know when they're done to make sure they should still come around. Um, when we had, um, I don't remember what the last event I was able to make it to, but um, it was just after the reconstruction of Poly. So we were given a tour, we were able to see everything that's going on now. <coughs> and it's those sort of things that wants to keep you to come back as often as you can. And when current players see alumni are around, it, I think that helps to motivate them to want to come around once they're gone. So it's just kind of a trickle effect. If, they see that there are alumni that are still around that are still participating. It's going to help encourage them to want to be around and participate more once they are finished at the school as well. We have student workers all over the office and they get very involved. And some of our student managers have gone on to be multi-millionaires. There's nothing like coming out of the, um, the equipment room to teach you, you know, how to uh, set your goals and how to accomplish things. Um, so there's all kinds of opportunities and we love to have our students involved. And it's in a variety of different ways. You can do different things every day. So we do take walk-ons on occasion. Um, we've got a couple of walk-ons that have come through our women's basketball program, which doesn't really take them, but they wouldn't take no for an answer, and ultimately they won scholarships. And so it's possible to even do that. If you're interested, you can let you know contact the coaches um, ahead of time and just see what the policy in those particular sports are. But and there's lots of opportunities, and I think a lot of kids have gone on to great careers having been come through our, our um, office. Okay, any more questions? Oh, there's a question up to the front. Hi, I'm Gloria. Um, this is directed towards Katrina. Um, Does it work? Oh, okay. <laughs> so, um, I love what you're doing. I love the program here, and unfortunately, I always wanted to be a student athlete, but started late and things occurred in my life, but I love, I just want to do what you're doing, essentially, and I think it's awesome. And I was just wondering if you had any advice for me. I just graduated in 2014. There's, it's a very, um, it's a very competitive field right now, but there's always opportunities. And I was not an athlete myself, um, but there, there were ways that I could get involved. So there's plenty of opportunities. and. It's a broad field. If you look at the um, non-football Division I schools, they have opportunities there. And when you get in, you'll be able to do several things because they're smaller staffs. You come to UCLA, let's say you come into academic advising, you will be a specialist in that if you do an internship with us. If you go into marketing, you'll be a specialist in marketing. 
Now you'll see some of the other things, but you won't get in depth there. So you, I, I think in Southern California we have lots of schools, and so we do have some internship programs, our mentors are <laughs> interns, and so I just encourage you to follow up and, and look at the various programs. Now the um, sports management programs, USF, I'm one of the people that I talk to 20 of them <coughs> every single year. Uh, they all call, and um, it's great. It's a great program, and that also has a required internship, and so you get in the door somewhere. So um, there's lots of opportunities. I had some cohorts in my grad program that did uh, academic advising at UCLA and at LMU. So, and some of them made it a full-time job, so mm -hmm. it's certainly cool. So you would recommend like a master's in sports management? I'll give you my card, you can follow up. <laughs> sorry. Don't be sorry. Yes. 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 of my time on mental health issues. It is the primary um, topic of discussion and although it hasn't gone through, the director of sports medicine at the NCAA is initiating a conversation to stop drug testing for marijuana and divert that money into mental health issues. So that's controversial. They pulled it off the agenda. It was on the agenda. I couldn't wait to hear what that discussion was like, but they pulled it off. But I think it's going to, we're going to start that that conversation because it is a, a problem in this country. I believe it's probably a problem in many developed countries in the world. What I would suggest you do as a coach is one, keep coaching and get other people to do it and take their little devices away and tell their parents to take their devices away. These kids do not, they are plugged in at all times. I practically get run down every day walking <laughs> from the parking lot to my car. People bump right into me. They literally, I'll stop and just say, oh, let's see if they even have a spatial awareness of where they are. Um, no, they don't. <laughs> Nor do they seem to care because I say, oh, excuse me, well, I'm standing still. They walk right into me and don't even say anything. So more adults and young people that play sports telling them, just let's, let's unplug a little and let's actually have an activity and let's talk to one another. Um, they text each other to break up in college. They text each other to go out. But literally, they do this. They do not talk. And you know, the kids in sports, again, talk. And they know how to talk to adults. And I really am concerned about where this is all going to go. I don't want to sound like an old bogey. But I think there are some things that we really want to make sure. And certainly at UCLA, we want the people that are coming here to be leaders and be able to have those skills. Thank you. Okay, well, um, this is our discussion. Um, our panelists will be here for a few more minutes. I would like to thank them. I appreciate the time. Um, I appreciate your time. I'm glad that we were able to reschedule this. Um, and hopefully we'll have more opportunities in the future to <coughs> feature um, women in sports. So thank you again very much. <laughs>